Hi, everyone, and welcome to our December Meaningful Speech Lunch and Learn. Today, we have Marge Blanc here with us today. I'm really excited because Marge was the first person I interviewed when I started this Lunch and Learn series. And now Marge gets to be the last person in 2022 that I get to interview or converse with again. Many of you probably, hopefully, already know all about Marge, but in case you don't, I am going to introduce her with her bio. So Marge Blanc is the director of the Communication Development Center in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a nonprofit clinic that she founded in 1997. Until two years ago, CDC provided individualized physical and linguistic support for neurotypical and neurodivergent children and young adults with complex communication profiles. Now CDC is the center of a growing international effort to share research and resources about Gestalt language development. Marge began combining clinical practice and clinical research in 1994 after she met her first autistic client as a clinical associate professor at the University of Wisconsin. Recognizing his delayed echolalia, Marge delved into the work of Barry Prezant, Ann Peters, and other qualitative researchers who had documented Gestalt language processing as a way of processing language naturally and they outlined the stages of Gestalt language development. That was Dr. Berry Prezant in 83. After her client followed the stages in the way predicted by Prezant, Marge decided to follow Prezant's recommendation to conduct research to describe that process in detail. Founding her clinic in 1997, Marge continued to document how GLPs develop language from delayed echolalia to self-generated language. Marge coined the term natural language acquisition, NLA, to describe that process and to emphasize the fact that echolalia is not a pathology and should be recognized as the first stage of Gestalt language development. Marge first used the term NLA in 2005 when she published the article, Finding the Words to Tell the Whole Story, based on the case study of her first autistic GLP. Marge continued her clinical research until 2010 and assembled her findings in the book, Natural Language Acquisition on the Autism Spectrum, The Journey from Echolalia to Self-Generated Language, which was published in 2012. Endorsed by Prezant as, quote, the most comprehensive consideration of echolalia in language characteristics of persons with autism to date, end quote. The NLA book is known as a seminal work that brings us back to a crucial understanding of language characteristics and language acquisition in ASD. And Prezant wrote that in 2015. Along with Prezant and two other colleagues, Marge presented NLA at the American Speech and Hearing Association Convention in 2014. Lillian Stiegler was in that audience and recognizing the significance of NLA, this seasoned CSD professor wrote an AGSLP review article bringing NLA to the academic community in 2015. Marge then authored several NLA presentations and workshops on NLA in 2016, and these steps spawned a movement that is now taking NLA into countries in North, South, and Central America, Europe, and Asia. Marge's pioneering research is helping SLPs, SLTs, and other speech and language professionals understand that echolalia is meaningful communication and the first stage in the journey towards self-generated language. Marge is the author of three online continuing education programs offered through Northern Speech Services. Northern Speech also sells her book, and she presents regularly to school districts and other educational organizations, provides networking and education for SLPs through the CDC website, and you can find all the info on that at communicationdevelopmentcenter.com, and I will put that in the notes at the bottom of this recording. Welcome, Marge. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks, you guys, for being here. I see Kate has stayed up late tonight, too. <laughs> So um, all of you probably know from being in my community that Marge is my mentor and helped get Meaningful Speech started and has contributed so much to the course. And um, I would say that um, 
her book basically changed my career and um, the mentoring that she was able to provide me. And now I get to be here and talk to all of you about this all the time. Um, and I really wanted Marge to come on today to talk with me. She said she wanted a conversation. I said I wanted to interview her. Um, <laughs> but we're going to talk together today really about a bunch of different topics, but mainly about some of this pushback that we're getting from speech language professionals and others in related fields about the existence of Gestalt language development. I know a lot of SLPs also are upset, concerned, insert any emotion about not having learned this in graduate school and are wondering why they're just hearing about it now. So I want to talk about all of that with you today, March. <laughs> what do you want to get started with? Well, you know, knowing that that was one of the questions that had um, come in from one of the Meaningful Speech members, I did go back to some of my former colleagues at the university to refresh my memory. Because those were the days, I mean, this was mid 90s, when Barry Present was doing workshops, and Amy Weatherby was doing workshops, and really, Gestalt language development was a part of at least eight books that I have on my bookshelf right now that I that I got you know, back in that time. So I asked my colleagues about that. And um, what they said was that when it was presented, it was not presented as Gestalt language development. And I say it, what is the it? Well, let's just say when Barry Prezant's work or Amy Weatherby's work or any of the others who did the qualitative research back then, when their work was presented, it was presented in a form that left you still wondering about that graph that's in um, the 1983 um, article of Barry Presents, which is that at stage one, you have these gestalts. I don't think there's a whole lot of controversy about that. Well, of course there is today, um, but there wasn't then. It was like, yeah, sure, we can recognize that gestalts are meaningful and that echolalia is not a pathology. Sure, that's not difficult. Um, stage two wasn't even all that difficult to acknowledge because you could see, I mean, kids were just doing it. You know, they would just mitigate and say, it's a ball, it's a plane, it's a car. And that wasn't too difficult to understand. Stage three got a little dicey because when you look at the 1983 article, it looked as if something from an analytic perspective was kind of emerging. And the way you, Alex, and I would say it is, yeah, it's emerging, but it's not emerging from dust. You know, it's emerging from what's happened before. So I think back in those days, we just didn't have enough kids to look at like we do now. You know, we have so many parents who are telling us stories. You know, we have, you know, a half dozen at least every day who tell us a new story. And we see stage three reinvented in front of our eyes. You know, it's just I, like I've said before, it's just every time I see stage three, it's just a miracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I call it the magic stage. It, it, yeah, that's a great way to describe it. Yep, it is. And you don't always get to see it with your own eyes because like we know with our littles, you know, it can happen so quickly. And with the kids who we didn't know they were speaking that much, you know, it can happen, you know, in an invisible way because obviously language is in our heads. You know, we don't need a behavior to, we like that. We like it if they would say it or if they would use, um, a, you know, some multimodal communication means to let us know, but they don't need that. They can do it in their heads. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that's part of the reason is that life was simpler back then. 
And we see, you know, you go back and read Ann Peters, the, all the anecdotes that come from the qualitative researchers, you know, from that perspective, from the linguistic perspective. And my goodness, the linguistic environment back then was so much easier. And if all you heard was your big brother saying, you know, in the example, you know, that I used, you know, back in the, the first article, you know, let's get out of here. You know, big brothers still say that today, but you know, you've got Bluey and everybody else who's, yeah, YouTube, exactly. And for better and for worse. I mean, it's both, both things. I mean, we're not going to redo, you know, pandemic language um, inputting, you know, we, we kind of have it, but there's so many advantages, you know, to be able to replay and to hear it again and um, to have language that um, th that we can see, we can go back to the YouTube ourselves and see it ourselves. So we aren't left with only big brothers, you know, gestalts uh, that get mitigated during the, the bedtime soliloquies. So for better and for worse, you know, it's just more complicated. So anyway, um, did that even begin to answer the question? So I think that the answer to the question is, I hate to say it, but very similar to the person who was, those of you who are in the NLA Facebook group, the disgruntled new member said that it just seems, what was her word? Unlikely, or it just seems almost preposterous. Can this be true? Really? You know, and I think about that. I think about how, um, you know, in a, in a quote in her vernacular, a science-based profession, do we have these really complicated things like gestalts that we have to read between the lines? You know, how preposterous is that? But back when the world was flat, now I don't know <laughs> if many of you were around back at that time when the world was flat, but we knew it was flat. <laughs> you know, we knew it until we knew it wasn't, you know? Yeah, I want to jump in, though, and say, so those of you that aren't in Marge's Facebook group, she has a long post about someone she called a disgruntled new member who basically was questioning Gestalt language development um, and saying, you know, how can this be true? I want to jump in and say that um, I've been noticing a lot lately that a lot of the pushback is coming from people that... I'm going to say are just not down in the trenches. So people that are not directly on a daily basis working with autistic um, students, clients, patients, etc. Um, I think that some school SLPs fall in this group. If you are a school SLP and you are working at a typical elementary school, a lot of your caseload might be articulation, um, other things, fluency, et cetera. Um, and maybe, maybe you have one or two or three um, autistic children on your caseload that maybe are using delayed echolalia. You're not entirely sure. I feel like those are the people that are questioning this the most. The people that are in and out parenting or working with neurodivergent or autistic kids that are communicating with delayed echolalia, think everyone else is crazy. How could this not be true? And that was kind of the position I was in. And I shared my story a little bit today on social media. But when I went into private practice, the majority of kids that were on my caseload were autistic individuals. And that's why this changed everything for me because I went in there trying to use analytic techniques and things ABA professionals had told me. I had no idea uh, about any of this until I came across Marge's book. And again, like I said, it changed everything. And for me, that's all it took because I was down in the trenches doing this every day. And so I just kind of wanted to bring that up. If you have people that are questioning you, I'm going to say 9.5 times out of 10, they don't have a lot of experience with this population. What do you think, Marge? You're nodding. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, 
I think that one of the people who wrote an endorsement of the book said exactly that. And that is um, that she was working in a new setting and she said, you know what, I tell parents about this and they just are so relieved because they knew it already, mm -hmm. but they didn't have a name for it. And it's funny about that because, you know, as for the parents who are in this group, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just a sad thing that your truths have not been acknowledged for such a long time. And that, that to me is the piece that makes the Meaningful Speech Forum and the NLA group so beautiful is that it's not just, I'm going to say, you know, pejoratively, like self, you know, pejorative, it's not just a bunch of SLPs sitting around, you know, in the corner trying to decide how kids develop language. I mean, <laughs> it's such a sad thing. I mean, first of all, you know, I'm sure you know this from the SLPs you've met in your life, if you're a parent, is most of us tend to be pretty darn analytic. You know, we tend to be pretty left brain people who love language, but we love things that are kind of ordered, you know? <laughs> and things that are a little bit different from ordered, you have to actually use your whole brain, you know, and SLPs aren't always used to that unless, like Alex, you're saying, unless we know kids deeply, you know. Mm -hmm. So just stemming off of that, Marge, there's a couple parents here in the chat that are watching us live right now. And one mom said, um, basically, she's in the course, she learned about it from her SLP, but the SLP, um, she said, isn't trained in it, so probably hasn't dug into it too deeply. She said, nor is the school or my child's OT. She says, I'm overwhelmed with trying to figure out how to train them. I've shared preliminary information, but it seems hard for them to grab. What is your advice there, Marge? That is such a good question. And, you know, I hate to fall back on the old saw that it all depends, but if you have a good relationship with someone who is a naysayer, you know, you can share some things. I mean, really, truly share some things, deep things, you know, like, you know what my child did yesterday? Let me tell you the, the like that amazing um, little clip that we've all seen of the boy who um, is using a device to uh, express how happy he is about his uh, birthday party experience. And he uses it with um, a media gestalt. And those anecdotes, I think, probably speak louder than, you know, going back to any article or like, here's the book or, you know, those things are like so top down, if you will, that an experience that resonates with another person like if that particular not to say only parents get it but if that SLP at school or anybody else at school knows a child well you know an anecdote I think is probably the best place to go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's so hard in the schools and I talked about this I think in my interview with Rachel Dorsey a little bit about how difficult it is to get to know a child well and I'm a lot of wonderful, amazing school SLPs are in this community and have gotten to know children well. But there are also SLPs working at schools where they have 75, 80, 90 kids on their caseload. And it's really difficult for them to get to that point where they know kids well. So Marge, what if a parent is dealing with an SLP like that, extremely overwhelmed, um, huge caseload, what can a parent do? Well, you know, again, it, I mean, if, if you feel as if, if you as a parent feel as if there will be a meeting of the minds, if you could only just take this person out to lunch and share stories, if you think that is potential, then I'd bring a little clip, video clip on my phone mm -hmm. and show them because as Alex does, and as I do in my own clinic, you know, we never start by you know, bringing a child in without knowing as much as we possibly can about that child. And that includes, you know, real videos from home. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how can anyone, we know this in science, speaking of science, but we know there is an observer effect. 
There's no such thing as standing outside and saying, oh, I'm just an observer. But if you're watching a video of a child, you really can observe and not feel like we all do. I mean, we all feel responsible if we're a parent or an SLP or anyone else. We all feel responsible. We want to do a good job. And so if we are in conversation, sometimes we have to defend ourselves because if we don't, it sounds as if we never cared in the first place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, generally speaking, everybody cares. And so sometimes just sharing a little, you know, two minute clip of your child doing something that says to you, the parent, this, this will demonstrate to you what I, what I know about my child. Um, and I think nowadays with technology, it's so much easier. Parents are taking video of their kids all the time to just say, Hey, can you share a couple of videos with me? And, um, that's something that you and I both discussed when we talk about assessment, Marge, but to be honest, I don't really think it's happening that much. And it's difficult for people to make it happen, especially in places like schools, um, so I want to um, talk about a couple other things and then swing back to schools, because one of the big questions that came up when we polled members was, what do I do about, you know, Gestalt language processing in the schools, or if my child is a Gestalt language processor? Um, so I'm going to swing back to that, but I want to comment um, about a couple things that came up here in the chat. So someone wrote, professionals feel uncomfortable referring out and willing to say that they don't know what the best approach is. And I think this is another huge problem happening right now in our field. A lot of SLPs feel like I've been doing this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. How did I not know about this? And it's almost embarrassing or, you know, they're having these negative feelings and they don't want to admit that they could have been wrong all these years. Um, and I think that's going to continue to become a big problem in our field as we keep spreading the word about this, because the majority of us never learned it. So what's your advice there, Marge? How do you deal with a professional who said, I've been doing this 40 years. You're telling me what I've been doing has been wrong this whole time. Well, I mean, I hopefully you as a parent are not having to confront that person, you know, directly in that kind of a way that doesn't, I mean, good grief. I think I might just walk down the hall and see if there's somebody else I can talk to. <laughs> I, don't think I, would. I mean, you know, it, this is going to sound a little bit like, you know, pejorative in another kind of a way. But, you know, as I worked with many, many young people in my clinic over the years, because we were right next to campus and, you know, undergrad students didn't have a clinical experience, you know, after a certain date. And so they would come and, you know, work in my clinic. And, you know, one of them said to me one day, you know what, I think younger is better. <laughs> And I know we've heard that from some of the students who um, do learn this in school. And that is, it becomes so intuitive. It's like, oh, yeah, so you model something longer instead of a single word. Oh, OK, fine. You know, and so but if it's someone who says, I've been doing this for 40 years and I'm not going to change now, then, yeah, I would go somewhere else. I mean, yeah, parents have probably as more power than, um, you know, we realize it's just very, very sad to think about, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't even begin to try to argue with someone who is that set in their ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we're going to find a couple, well, more than a couple, but two main groups of SLPs out there. The group that's like, wow, you're right. I'm going to change everything. I'm going to learn about this. And then there is going to be that group that is going to fight and say, no, this is the way that I've done it for 20 years. I'm not going to change anything. Yeah, I'd go down the hall. I really would. Now you might say, well, I can't because my child's in school. That's the only option I have. But, you know, just in this last week, as you say, Alex, when kind of the, the naysaying got to be rather um, voluminous, um, 
you know, how many parents did I talk to who said, I'm not going there. I'm just not going there. And we have, I mean, not everybody can be a homeschool mom. Not everybody can, you know, take their child out of that, this preschool and find another one. But on the other hand, you know, this doesn't take an SLP necessarily to be the one who is the primary conversation partner. Mm -hmm. And so if the SLP at school says, no, I'm gonna sit them down and they'll probably won't talk like that, but they'll say they're gonna request this because that's the way I was taught. And then you say, well, thank you, bye. And you, you do let your child continue if you feel like it is a safe thing to do. But my goodness, we're learning so much about you know, sensory safety and maybe we're not gonna go there. But anyway, go home. Um, it's gonna be winter break right now. So spend the next two weeks or however long you have and just play with it yourself. You know, if you're not an active part of the Meaningful Speech, you know, um, forum, be active. You know, or if it's the, the NLA Facebook group or whichever group is in your locale or country, just do it and see what you can do in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit more about that, Marge, parents and what they're doing at home. So we have a parent here in the chat that is, I, I think, probably a little overwhelmed that has not um, gotten too deep into the course. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. She has it, but hasn't, you know, really investigated much. So she's saying uh -huh. her um, SLP is using an analytic approach. Her child is not interested in neurotypical play and all her language is from sentence strips that she's been drilled with. Aww. So yeah. How old is she? She is, old is five. She's five. Okay. So first of all, I want to say to this parent, you are not alone. I talk mm -hmm. about this all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I said this in an interview recently on a podcast. A lot of us as speech pathologists have been doing a disservice to our kids. We've almost been interrupting their natural language development by trying to drill and practice and teach them these this survival language or what a lot of people will call functional language. So your job as a parent at home is to bring things back to almost like a natural state to think about how you would speak naturally to your child. And Marge, you do such a awesome job talking about this. What would a day look like for a parent that wants to get back to modeling natural language to a child that has been drilled with sentence strips? Well, you know, and, and a great thing that we have winter break coming up because you might have that opportunity within this two weeks, if you've got two weeks to do exactly that. You know, with the older students, it's that's such a, you know, it takes longer than two weeks to get back to a natural place. But with a very young child and with a five-year-old, you can do it. And the first thing is, okay, I, I'm thinking about five things here. So maybe the first thing is, is to change your sense of timing. So with a sentence strip or with a PEX or with a compliance-based procedure, the child, not you, but the child is used to the idea that they don't get to do anything really. And that they have to wait for you to either ask the question or give them the choice or prompt them or withhold or something or another. So if you don't worry about all of that right now, but just think about the timing and think I'm going to, I'm gonna use the term preempt which may or may not be exactly the best word, but get a word in edgewise. You know, start your day as yourself, a free agent on this planet to talk about what you are doing. So you're gonna, you're gonna wake up your child and, or, you know, vice versa. And, and you're going to go and figure out something yummy to eat and hopefully something nutritional at the same time. And you say, oh, let's have 
And then you name the thing that the child would most want on this planet. And so that's the preempting. And so, you know, stimulus response, you're going to go the other way around and you're going to preempt that and say, let's have pancakes. Yeah, let's have pancakes. And then if you if you get your child's undivided attention at that moment, then you can continue and say, wait, 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 wait. No, let's have, and then you make a joke and you say, let's have mm, scrambled eggs. Ew. Or, you know, this it all depends on you know how much your child is really listening to you at that moment. And obviously they may not show that. They may be so shocked that they're thinking, what, what, pancakes, really? I don't have to do anything to get pancakes. And so then you, you know, just like you're almost like parallel play. If you have another child in your, in your brood and you've learned how to do parallel play, that is you don't put the pressure on the child. You just go about something that is in, in tandem. And so you get the socks and shoes and you get everything and you get all cozied up and you go downstairs and you say, I know, let's get, oh, wait, blueberries. Yeah, let's get blueberries. And so you get some blueberries out of the fridge and you just keep going like that all day long. And you don't worry about, is your child looking at you? Is your child, you know, focused on what you're doing? Is there any joint attention? No, just get used to it. Get used to being a mom again. Oh, then, I love that yeah. line. Get used to being a mom again. I absolutely love that. I think so many parents are so used to trying to make their kids say something, um, using every situation to try to extract that language. And I think just, again, that word natural, like going back to what feels natural. Yeah. And, and then, and so you do have to play with yourself a little bit that first day, because you're going to feel weird. You're going to feel like, oh, people have told me I can't get blueberries until he asks for blueberries, you know? So it's, it's yourself who has to make this big leap. And it may be your child too. It may be that your child isn't going to believe this good fortune for a day, you know, and, and really, you know, ponder like what, you know, what's happened to mom. But um, after, after you have that first buy-in, you know, that Alex and I would use that term to say, is this child, does this child believe me? You know, well, there's the buy-in. Mm -hmm. you know? And a child doesn't have to say, let's, let's get pancakes. The child doesn't have to say or do anything. I mean, you know, already, that your child is hearing you. He may not be quote listening, so to speak, because do we even know what that means? You know, if the child is hearing you while they're playing in the corner, if the child is hearing you while they're, you know, playing, you know, uh, a song over on their um, iPad, if the child is in the vicinity, probably in the next room, he's probably hearing you just fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't obviously apply to everyone. I'm not trying to be you know, one size fits all here, but. I think um, modeling without expectation is basically how to sum all that up. So you are modeling and speaking with the natural language without expectation that the child is going to respond, say something, use certain words. Um, and I know it feels scary. I guess I'm speaking to all the new parents out there and new SLPs. It feels very scary to do this when you've been given other advice. Um, and so one of the things I've been talking about a lot lately with some um, parent consultations I've been doing is about starting to listen to your gut again and listening to your intuition. I think so many parents have blocked that out because they have been listening to well-meaning professionals, but when they really sit and listen to what their own self is trying to tell them, it's like, yeah, I, I should just kind of be narrating what I'm doing in the kitchen. I shouldn't be standing at the table trying to force certain language to come out. Right. And you know, I think another 
factor here that we all kind of know, but we should talk about it, is back when Barry Prezant's word should have been golden, back then um, was in the day when um, autism was just being kind of discovered a bit. Um, I mean, we knew about it obviously for a very, very long time as if there was an it that we thought we knew about back then, but that was the day and age, the 80s and 90s and into 2000, when autism was considered obviously a pathology. And so if you were autistic, it was almost, well, it was, it was presumed, you know, you, you couldn't develop language. You just couldn't. And so it's taken a generation, I hate to say it, but it is a whole generation of, you know, trauma victims mm -hmm. who have informed us, mm -hmm. you know, and so it is a different day and age. It is a different day and age. And so, like you say, Alex, you know, we all were taught that you had to learn language. You had to, sorry for the word learn. It's not about learning. It's about developing um, that you had to develop language. Well, okay, let's just be honest. Okay. Um, ABA talks about learning. SLPs talk about developing. You know, before ABA became so dominant in our, you know, atmosphere, um, SLPs used to say learn like it wasn't a bad thing. But now I think we're trying to train ourselves not to say learn anymore. We don't learn language. You know, we develop language naturally. And so I catch myself using the old vernacular that we all felt comfortable with because we didn't have to argue this point with anyone. But then came the day and age when we had to argue everything. And I remember those early days in the 90s when ABA had just come to town in Madison and SOPs weren't allowed to be on a team. You know, OTs weren't allowed to be on a team. So, you know, those of us who've been around even as long as Alex, you know, know those days. I mean, we were out of the picture. And so not only were parents out of the picture, but people who believed in child development were out of the picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, oh, and I realized that those days are just hitting in some parts of even this country and certainly other countries now. But yeah. um it feels like it came a little bit earlier to our area of the Midwest, Marge is in Wisconsin, I'm outside of Chicago, and now we're hearing from people like Dr. Stiegler, who's in New Orleans, that, you know, that's just starting to happen down there, so. Um, and believe it or not, you know, that's why I love talking to those of you in the UK, because, you know, National Health Service doesn't pay for ABA, that's why we're all moving there. <laughs> but, but right after Alex's course, I think we all will just take up residence. Seriously. I am sure you've all heard, but thanks to Kathy Schilling, I'm going to be coming to the Cotswolds area and London in June to be holding two day workshops. Marge was invited as well, but she did decline. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't I'm know why. I hear it. <laughs> But anyway, um, so things, yeah, so so parents were left out of the picture. Um, and, you know, it's been happening and SLPs were left out of the picture. So SLPs, if you wanted to be in the picture, you kind of had to go along with something that ABA would allow. I mean, truly, and this is my last little anecdote here and we can move on. In 1995 or six, the only thing an SLP was allowed to do in in many kids you know school programs was pick the sound that the ABA person was going to work on mm -hmm. seriously mm -hmm. so we've come a long way from there but on the other hand you know it's it's going to take us it's going to take a while yes um do you have time to stay on another 15 minutes march or do sure. you Hard stop. Okay. Usually I do these for 45 minutes, but I feel like we haven't gotten through some of the questions. So I want to keep you a little bit. 
Um, one of the things I, I promised that we would swing back to is schools and GLPs. Um, it's something I've been getting a whole lot of questions about, so I want to address it. Um, so basically, parents who are figuring out, finding out that their child is a Gestalt language processor and maybe taking a course, maybe reading the book, maybe working with their SLP are doing what they need to be doing language wise. But now they're asking, what do we do at school? How does this translate to academics? What do we do in the classroom? So I was wondering if you could speak on that, Marge. You betcha. Well, the first thing I would say is join us in, and I say us, the collective us, um, whoever is willing to be part of this group um, or groups, plural. We need to all work on this um, because right now there are plenty, plenty of good ideas um, that are happening. And, you know, those of you who've seen my little um, Zoe in any of the courses that I've done or um, any of the NJAs, well, not any, but one, one at least um, NJAs course, um, her mom is uh, her mom discovered NLA before I ever met this little girl. And she lived, you know, a couple miles away from me. But anyway, so her mom is a wonderful uh, teacher who has a beautiful classroom that would be a perfect model for any of us who want to reinvent education, which by the way, we are going to have to do collectively um, during the next five to 10 years. But at a very simple level, if there is um, an SLP who does push in, meaning comes into the classroom, um, that person can set the stage for everything that happens. And that is simply by doing a couple of the basics, which, you know, the, one of the basics is to not attempt to start a conversation with a question to, you know, because obviously we know our GLPs pick up that question as a gestalt, of course. So just by not asking questions and with a teacher who is quite willing to say, let's have some choices here. Oh, let's get apples. Oh, wait, let's get, let's get cookies today and watch the face, watch the face of that child. And, and apples wasn't a good example, but something awful, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, there are plenty of ways to find out what a child likes and what a child would choose without asking a question. And then, you know, all of the things that we just do without thinking. You know, how, how about our children's books? Our children's books are written with the assumption, presumption, that kids have developed grammar, you know? Oh, it was a beautiful day and the stars had gone, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, how about it's morning? <laughs> Let's go. Let's get our coats. You know, you can say things in simple language that are basically short, simple, mitigable gestalts. Yeah. Mitigable just for that person who's just starting the course. Just a gestalt that you can break down when you're ready. Mm -hmm. And those things are very easy to do. And, and, and teachers are usually pretty happy to make um, language changes in the classroom that will actually probably benefit everybody because not all the ALPs, the analytic language processors in the class are necessarily with a full grammar system. So why not have simple sentences? Rephrase the words that are in the book so that they are GLP and probably ALP friendly. I love those suggestions. What about, we have another parent that popped into the chat here. What about subjects like reading, writing, and math? So right now, the way that most um, schools are set up, they are taking tests full of questions. I get, I get DMs about this all the time on Instagram. How do I quote unquote test a kid on their reading comprehension when I can't ask them a question? How do I test them on these math word problems? So do you have any thoughts there? 
Well, you know, and, and like you, Alex, I would, I would never try to answer a question like that at a, some kind of general level, because um, we'd need to know a lot about that child. And if the child is truly at stage one, right. you know, you're going to be doing something that's very, very different from how you've typically um, tried to quiz kids about a process um, that you are presuming in your mind must occur before a child can come up with the answer. So, um, you know, you, you think about if you're, if you're a Gestalt language processor, it's a very strong possibility that you're a Gestalt cognitive processor. And we don't have all the data on that, but I mean, good grief, that's what the adults who are telling us is that, you know, Gestalt language is just part of my Gestalt thinking, you know, it's not really all that different. And so if that's the case, and you might as well just you know, err on the side of, you know, giving it a good try, and, you know, take the whole apple and divide it up and put it back together again and see how that transfers to taking the whole of anything or then the piece of the orange or the piece of something else and seeing about putting it back together. Because you know, our, our GL, I mean, our GCPs, our Gestalt cognitive processors are probably whole to part, you know, learners, processors. And so there are plenty of ways that we can take that general concept. Now that's not reading and that's not comprehension, but we can do something similar in, in terms of reading that we would do with a, an ALP who's a kindergartner and who um, is just starting to get into literacy you know, where we scribe what they're saying out loud or what they're communicating with their AAC. And we can then, you know, put that in a, a format that is text-based and look at, you know, virtually anything. We can, we can really do that. And so we're just, the first rule there is just get rid of the test, the original test and look at your learner and figure out some ways that you can, um, using their own cognitive style, um, match that cognitive style with something that, you know, is is observable. Yeah. So a couple of things that I've seen that I I wanted to just add to this. Um, so I do have a post um, on Instagram about this. I'll share it to stories again today about everything we know regarding GLPs and literacy. Um, and I collaborated with Dr. Lillian Stiegler on the post. Um, so that's everything we know. People are constantly asking me about research in this area, don't have any. Everything we know is in this one post. Secondly, if you're confused about Gestalt cognitive processing, we have a bonus module on that in the course um, written and taught by autistic SLP, Rachel Dorsey. Um, and then the third thing I just wanted to add were my own experiences. And I did put some of those in the post when I um, originally wrote it. So I feel if at all possible, and you are able to work with your school, taking the pressure off academics until the child has moved to stages three and four and is self-generating if at all possible, because you're going to see a huge change once the child is self-generating. And then yes, you can start asking questions. And yes, you know, some of the grammar things Marge was talking about will come into play at that point. I've also heard from several parents that's around the time that their child starts to read on their own. Again, this is not true for everyone. You know, we've got our hyperlexic kids and kids that fall under other groups, but I've seen this with my own clients and I've seen this through parent consultations that I've done. Um, again, this is not possible everywhere, but there is a mom um, that I'm working with right now that is homeschooling and her child is nine and just started reading on her own and coincidentally is now in stage three to four. So I feel like I am seeing this. Marge, have you seen this as well? Sure. Yeah. And, and I hate to, yeah, absolutely. And I hate to make a completely general statement 
um, just like Alex, you know, if you have a particular individual you're thinking about as a teacher or as an SLP, um, or if you're the parent of such a child, you know, you might find that literacy is just, and this doesn't even have to be hyperlexia, you know, but you might find that, that literacy just matches, you know, so well in your life. And okay, so yeah, there's many, many considerations here. Yeah. But, you know, if you are one who you know your child is interested in print, and that just happens to be the thing that they choose, even if they're not, you know, officially hyperlexic, you know, having that print, you know, available, but in a, I mean, say your child is stage one or two, having it in a gestalt or mitigated gestalt form, yeah. like you can put on your fridge, you can put, it's a fridge, you know, let's open it, you know, so literacy doesn't have to, you know, wait until your child is at stage three and four, but yeah, at a general level, that would be certainly fair to say. Yeah. And if you're looking for more hyperlexia tips, we did have a SLP that specializes in hyperlexia on like last year in 2021, her name's Kira Nally, and you can find that in the lunch and learn um, modules. Um, so Marge, I know that you have some things that you would like to end on here. I do not believe we got through every submitted question. Um, but I think in general, we did one of the ones that I kind of wanted to end on, um, swinging back to the very beginning of our interview is, um, how this is not being taught in graduate school and what graduate mm -hmm. students can do. And then I believe you also have some tips for what everyone can do. Right. Yeah. And we probably should talk about graduate school for a while and not to discourage anyone who says, I need to make sure my alma mater, you know, has this course. It just may not happen. And I, I think that was kind of where I was thinking about what I was thinking about when I said, you know, back when Barry Prezant was a household name, it wasn't happening then. Mm -hmm. And it may well be, like Alex said, that this is an experiential way of looking at kids. You know, the world is still flat. The earth is still flat. And those of us who know it's round, you know, can say, Oh, let's make sure that we teach, you know, the round earth class at our, at our, you know, in our graduate program, it may not happen. And it may be, I have actually, I've, you know, I spent some time the last, you know, week when we were having all this naysaying going on, I did spend some time thinking about some next steps that we all can kind of pay attention to, but I'm not sure grad school is going to be the one. A, a particular professor who Alex and I know very well said, I think it's going to take 10 years. And I thought, what? What? And so, you know, you we have to remember that, you know, academia is made up of, you know, left brain people. And so, you know, not all, I mean, OTs are good grief. I'm so glad they are not left brain people, we wouldn't have anybody, you know, doing anything. But anyway, um, but we may, it may not happen. It just may not happen, you know, for the, for quite a while. But I think there are some things that we all can do that are going to make it imperative that Gestalt language development is acknowledged. And okay. I'll leave that little, little hint Okay, I want you to get into your list, but I'm going to jump in and add two things. Um, like that person said, 10 years is a really long time to wait. So um, that is why we are not waiting on our AAC and GLP course, and we're putting that out there. Everyone's saying, but there's no research on AAC and GLP. And you're right, and there might not be any for 10 years. But in the meantime, we're leaving parents and SLPs out there in the trenches, confused and unsure on what to do. So there are three pillars of evidence-based practice. If you go on asha.org, you'll see the triangle. 
And we are hitting two out of the three. We don't have the research, but we have research in Gestalt, Gestalt language development. We have re research in AAC. We're taking what we know to be best practices. And we're um, also talking about our clinical experiences and client experiences and putting that information out there. Marge is going to contribute to the course as well. That's gonna be out February 3rd of 2023. Um, the other thing I wanted to just address is people are wondering where ASHA stands in all of this. ASHA is very much in support of Gestalt language development. In fact, I hope this is okay to say Marge, but there may be something more between us and ASHA in the works for 2023. Um, we have already done a learning pass webinar that's available on ASHA and Dr. Stiegler did one on her own as well. If you Google Gestalt language development in ASHA, you will see their article on there. So I just wanted to address that before Marge got into her final list. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't. That was perfect. I can't add to it one little bit. Um, so I was thinking about all of you and I was thinking as Alex's course ends with, well, I mean, it'll still be there and you will have your forum and all of that will happen. But as the modules, um, wind down here in the next 15 minutes, um, what are some things that you could take away to feel empowered besides all that you know from the course and um, yeah. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, I was just reading the chat. Sorry, I got distracted there. No problem. Okay. That's been happening to me this whole time. My <laughs> eyes keep going over there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. Okay, good. Um, so now thinking about what you can do to um, feel empowered after today. Um, number one, I'd say keep talking to each other, just keep communicating. And whether it's in the forum, whether it's in the NLA group or one of the other groups, you know, that Kate is highly involved with or any of the others, you know, around the globe that we're finding now, keep talking. Don't worry about the naysayers. Just stick with like-minded people, share your stories. Okay, number two, and this is gonna sound a little odd, but I would say present. In other words, do a little presentation, whether it's 15 minutes with your play group and it's moms who've gotten together and they're doing things together, present to your group. I just remember one of the people who, was a cohort of mine um, at the university. And she was, she always would say to students, you know, you can learn skills, you can be skilled, but until you are consciously skilled, you have to remember that there's another step involved. And there's nothing better than having to present yourself than to say, what's that word mitigate? What, what mitigate really? I'm going to say mitigate out loud, you know, and so, you know, to your playgroup moms present. Um, I just another person said, after all the naysaying happened this week, one person um, uh, had a little post in the NLA group and she said, you know what my good deed for the day is tell somebody about NLA. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Number three. Don't worry about the general naysaying. I mean, if it's your if it's your child's SLP, obviously you're going to worry worry about that. But in general, don't worry about it. If, however, it's someone who's presenting a course, and we just heard about another one um, who's presenting that echolalia needs to be extinguished. Mm -hmm. If you hear about one of those courses, let Alex or me or one of the others who work with us, no. We don't want to let those just slide. Um, number four, share your anecdotes. 
I mean, we can talk about theory, we can talk about research, we can talk about, oh, Barry Present, what a great guy. We can do all those things. But until we are really sharing the anecdotes from our own child's life, the cute things that happen, I mean, the stories are just priceless. Share those anecdotes. Number five, and this is a broken record. You'll hear from the Meaningful Speech course. You'll hear it from the NLA courses that um, NLA, I mean, that NSS has. You'll hear it from Alex and me daily, but it, we'll say it again. Um, keep your language samples going. Do your language samples. And you, you, know, you might say, well, I'm just a mom. Well, do it anyway. You know, record that five minutes, write it down, word for word, including the spaces in between words, including the intonation, if you can get it, and keep that, keep the language samples, because, you know, as, as Dr. Stigler told us, that is our evidence, and that is our data, and so it's, you know, it's the baby book that we all need to keep. Okay. Um, number six. Um, okay. I think I, I really already covered this, but um, don't worry about anybody who says it is just preposterous. Don't worry about anybody who says it can't be. It's too complicated. How could a kid develop language that way? Don't worry because they do. We already know that. And so we have to remember that there's nothing about Gestalt language development that is a practice. It's what our kids do. We might as well just, you know, recognize it. And so NLA is nothing more than a description of that Gestalt language development process. That's all NLA is. Yes. Did I go farther and quantify it so we could use it for assessment? And did I add those two stages um, of grammar? Yes, but that was that was evidence based itself. You know, I mean that goes back to the work of Laura Lee back in the day who put together uh, developmental sentence types and developmental sentence scoring, which you've heard about in the course. Um, that's all NLA is. That's it. Um, Let's see. So that was number six, I think, I hope. Um, number seven. Um, we've talked about this earlier. Number seven, when they say, well, where's the evidence? <laughs> then you just become the broken record and say, oh, yeah, Barry Presents article. I have 50 of them in the back of my car. Let me just hand you one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, number eight. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So research, when people say, yeah, but we need more research, you say, yes, not to prove that Gestalt language development happens, we've got plenty of that, but yes, do we need to look at bilingual kids who are listening to um, the Spanish version of X and the English version of Y and the Hindi version of Z? Yes, do we need to look at those kids and add qualitative research about how they are doing this. I mean, we know some things. And if, if that's a topic you really want to talk about, we can talk about it more. But there's plenty of research that we do need to do. But we don't need to look at the research that's already been done. Nope. Nope. Those 50 articles in the back of my car will tell it all. Okay. Um, number nine, you're going to say, yeah, right. And that is write an article. So after you've addressed your playgroup or your school, you know, lunch bunch group, um, write an article. And it might be really a blog. It might be something that you're just writing for yourself and you don't think you're ever going to put it out there on the planet. But I saw a couple of you who said, yeah, I'd like to, you know, do more about um, classroom stuff. Well, write down what you know, write it down. You know, it's almost like journaling it, but a journal that you can um, share with others because we're gonna be doing a lot of work in the next five years. We're gonna be really, really busy and we're gonna need all of you. Mm -hmm. um, number 10, and this is the most important in a way, is language development, whether it's analytic or whether it's gestalt, 
or those sweet little ones who might be young enough and have a perfect environment to be both. Um, what it is, is natural. And so the main thing that we have to just remind ourselves is in all of this kerfuffle that's going on, we just need to believe in childhood. That's what it all comes down to. And that's why you as the parent or someone who is supporting a parent, you know, that's why that's so important is because ultimately what we're doing is believing in our kids and believing in their potential and their development. Well said, Marge. Thank you so much for all of that. All right, I kept you so long, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. We've, we've gone like 25 minutes over now. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for being here today, Marge. This is going to be available for everyone to view on YouTube later today or in the course. This is our last lunch and learn module that will be added to the course. And um, you can find it in, on either place. Um, please share the YouTube link with others, especially those that might be questioning things and need to see this. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. And we will be back in a little bit of a different way with some interviews in 2023. So stay tuned for that information. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. thanks Alex. Bye-bye.